Okay, I guess we get started here with the discussion itself. Okay, one of the first questions I have for you is, uh, what did you think you would be when you grew up? From an early age, I knew, I didn't think, I knew I was going to be a teacher. I just knew that. I wasn't sure if I'd be an elementary school teacher, junior high, high, college, university. I just knew I would teach. Well, I had wonderful examples in my mother, who was an elementary school teacher, and my father, who was a professor as well as a theologian. Um, and it was just something that I had a passion for even then learning and reading. So it's no, it's no wonder that I ended up uh, teaching literature. Well, it's kind of a segue to the next question in that we're here to partially discuss your book All right. as well as the events that occurred during that period of time that you're discussing in your book, but, uh, but you're an author as well. Yes. So how did you go from teaching to writing? <laughs> Almost by necessity. I... Um, I earned my uh, master's and Ph.D. degree um, at the University of Chicago, so it goes without saying that at that institution you are going to write. You are going to write if you want to get out alive, and I, I did. Um, I went on to um, teach literature at um, Michigan State University, and in that process, you know, the whole professorial tenure process, it, it, it is also required that you write, even though I loved writing, and I won't say it was second nature like reading is to me, but I enjoyed the writing, and I did a number of articles on literary criticism. Eventually, I did write a book um, based on my dissertation, which had to do with uh, the maternal psyche um, in uh, African-American women's literature. And um, coming back to Nashville, marrying you, coming back to Nashville, I felt after a while a real need to write this book about our segregated education. The high school that we both went to. Yes. Yeah. Where yeah. you did and, not and, notice me at all. <laughs> <laughs> I noticed. I just didn't see anything. All right. <laughs> I was bashful in those days. Uh, now, the background of this is that there's a lot of discussions around segregated education. That that comes after the period that we're going to be discussing. You mean we're, desegregated desegregation. education. Mm -hmm. And we're going to be discussing the area, the peri period just before that yes. in, in our high school. Yes. We, the title of your book uh, addresses the fact that we were the last uh, graduates of a high school That's right. be before desegregation occurred right. in Nashville, Tennessee. Okay, how does this perspective add to the conversation about desegregation? I believe that the past is prologue. The past... As Faulkner said, is never dead. It's just, it weaves its web, and, and we are all a part of that, and it determines in large part what we do, who we become, how we continue as, as life changes, whatever the dynamic is. And it's really difficult to understand the process of desegregation without knowing segregation. I mean, it's virtually impossible, and sadly, so many, like... Our granddaughter, when she was young, did not understand the concept of segregation uh, because her education had been so open. But to me, it's a necessary, um, it's a necessary beginning or backdrop, at least, to understand, for example, why desegregation was such a huge issue, even in northern cities uh, like Boston, like Chicago, like Minneapolis. And I did, incidentally, direct a desegregation initiative in Minneapolis for three years, uh, where there was a lot of pain in dealing with the racial issues that came up as a result of this process of our moving from segregated education to desegregation. So for me, it's a natural flow. It's okay. a dynamic that... Okay, before we go farther yeah. into that area, just a question in terms of your family background. What were the, your parents' expectations, and, and how do they view your future? Did they discuss those things with you? That's a chapter um, that I wrote in my book, and I'm, I'm so proud that my mother was able to read this chapter while she was still um, with us because... Uh, our parents had so much to do with the positive aspect 
of our upbringing in a hostile, racist um, society and, and educational environment. I wanted to honor them as well as very truly tell the story of how they navigated this incredibly fine line between too much love, not that I think there can ever be too much love, not, a, not a, enough love, too much encouragement, not, not enough encouragement. The way they used tough love compiled with deep affection, deep encouragement, and deep support is something that um, lives with me and with, I think, our classmates uh, to this day. So I shared what I think my parents did. They were always there for us. They were totally supportive parents, but they demanded a lot of us. We didn't understand at the time why sometimes they were so protective, why they were so vigilant, why they were, why they didn't allow for, you know, hanky-panky or when it's study time, it's study time. Uh, but we understood more as we grew older and grew more aware of the world you, you, outside. You and I have discussed this on, yes. on several occasions. Yes. They created a cocoon. Yes, they did. We lived uh, literally within the several blocks of where our homes were, Yeah, knowing which streets we could cross and which ones we couldn't cross. That's right. We knew what neighborhoods we could go to. That's we, right. We knew the people we could trust. Yes. And we literally lived in an environment of predominantly all blacks. Yes. Until we crossed those streets. That's right. So, and, and but man, our teachers and parents managed somehow or another to give us a world that felt safe. They did. In spite of all that. That's... It, it was pretty unique. Yeah, it was. Now, back to the education piece of that, how do you feel that uh, segregated education affected you? I, I'm going to go back to, well, when we married 18 years ago, and I came back to Nashville um, having spent my entire, I was born in Atlanta, but my family moved here when I was six, as you know, and I spent my entire elementary and high school years here in Nashville before going back to Atlanta for college and then other places. Mm. When, I, when I married you, that was a fine decision on my part. It brought me back here after 40 years, and I, I emphasized the 40 years to make this point I got involved in our alumni association, and because I had studied so much um, psychology and psychoanalytic theory in graduate school, certain, certain behaviors jumped out at me that I think had I lived here, I would have missed. It's kind of like if you see somebody after 40-year absence, it's going to really strike you. Uh, if you are with them day to day, it's really no big deal. But things came to me in bar relief that um, um, I think Nashvilleans who had never been away from here did not grasp. And one of those things was that we as a group of people uh, have certain behavioral commonalities that can be placed squarely at the foundation of the racial realities of our time, educational as well as social. And that's why I named the, I, I entitled the book, it's, it's a mouthful, but I'm gonna, I'm gonna say it all at once, Who We Are, uh, Cameron High School Alumni, parenthesis 1957 through 71, close parenthesis comma, uh, Nashville's last generation of segregated education. So that pinpoints us, and I wanted to do that because I wanted to put the major factors uh, in how and why we became who we are. For example, I've noticed this about you. I noticed it when we were dating. Um, you don't go into a place without knowing points of egress and ingress. No. You, you, you know exactly how to get in and how to get out. That's unfortunate in some ways because we know where that came from, it's very fortunate in other ways because you're always, again, you're always, always vigilant. Prepared. And as a black male, I can understand that more than for me because it was more difficult even, if I can say that, for 
for males than for females. I'd like to add one other piece of that. That's the apprehension of even going into those places. I understand I'm, that as well. I was a, a pretty good product of segregation. Yeah. Brainwashed. We all? Yes. And re clearly reluctant to do a lot of things that most people would take as just natural and normal. It's taken me a lot of years to get past that. Well, even today, I have some apprehension. Do you know? I there's a part of the book where I talk about uh, uh, our group having some sort of low grade PTSD. I really meant that. I don't think that's yeah. I, I don't think that's uh, pressing the point too much because when I look at some of our behaviors, uh, yeah, you know, look how quick we are to just say to the waiter, "Excuse me, we're seated here right next to the uh, bathroom. Uh, there are loads of other uh, tables. Could we?" have another table. And as soon as we say it, we, we're, we're never challenged. Never it's rejected. just, oh, of course. But then why put us there in the first place? We're, it, so we are very, very aware of certain behaviors, sometimes um, maybe a little slow to smile or to approach someone just because uh, damaging, horrible messages that you are inferior you have no business being here. You have germs. Therefore, you can't eat uh, at the same restaurant. You can't drink from the same water fountain. You're, you're dirty and filthy, so you can't, you can't try on these clothes before you buy them. All these messages were so invasive and so damaging to our psyches. I think that's part of why I did a lot of study uh, on psychology. Our parents and our teachers had to work so hard, not even to overcome these messages, but to try to get us to a place where we had some measure of decent self-esteem. Let, let's go back to some of your experiences in high school itself. Now, how did those uh, days in a segregated situation affect you and your educational process? Hmm. What were some of the things you were exposed to, handicaps or uh, things that you felt you may have been denied or opportunities maybe missed? Here's a... Uh Here's something that might seem contradictory, even counterintuitive, but it's not at all when you think about why I wrote the book and, and the kind of work that our parents and teachers and community uh, leaders and community members, for that part, community mm -hmm. members, did for uh, us. We were in an all-black situation not one white face, not among the janitorial staff, the lunchroom staff, to completely black, completely segregated, as were you know, the white schools, um, except I dare say some of the service uh, people in white schools. Um, and you would think that being in that situation, understanding that we were in that situation primarily, exclusively because of segregation, we would feel we would have negative feelings. What we had, as you spoke to already, were extremely positive feelings, extremely nurturing feelings. We were in a loving, a caring, a supportive environment. Safe. Safe. There's a there's a pack, there's a part in the book where I talk about us as Panthers, because Panthers were our that that was our what do you call Mascot. that? Yeah, thank you. Yeah. <laughs> My age, you forget sometimes. Um, I, I said we were, we were lithe, we were sleek, we were black, we were supple, we were powerful, we were panthers. This is who we were able to be. That's why who we are. In that school, in that cocoon, in that setting, outside that setting, whole nother story. So for me the very power of being able to just plain be myself was incalculable. I couldn't even tell you. We could just be who we were because there were no interdictions, no prohibitions, no, no nasty shouts, no hostility. There was none of that. There was, you know, young lady, be excellent. Do your best. Be, be your best student. Be your best self. We were taught, and this is something that I'm so sorry that we, I think, have lost, not only as a, a culture, as an African-American culture, but as a society in general in our nation, we were actually taught manners, comportment, behavior towards others, 
We were taught that the golden rule was primary. If you don't want it done to you, then don't do it to anybody else, you know? Be true to yourself, but be true to your best self. Be your best self. You know, one other piece of that were the uh, teachers. Because, mm. of, because of segregation, mm -hmm. we got the smartest we did. and the best students because there were no other jobs. Teachers. Teachers. Mm -hmm. the teachers, teaching, uh, teachers had the best jobs in the city for the most part. Unless, you know, you, obviously you could become a doctor or a lawyer and so forth. But the ones that taught us were, were always the straight-A students. They were the ones that came into school, and they carried, they t carried that into the cl classroom. They did. We had some phenomenal teachers. Extremely, we did. Extremely intelligent. They created an environment. We had uh, programs that we could participate in. The number of clubs, French clubs, yes. math clubs, science yes. clubs, across the school yes. uh, uh, were unlimited. Yes. Uh, we had chances to actually step, stand up in front of school and give presentations right. and discussions yes. and participate in any activity uh, involved. They created an environment that I would guess to say didn't happen in all schools. Oh, I know mm -hmm. it didn't, and I, I clearly said that, and, and uh, this is being objective. There's frankly no way, well, I, sh I should pinpoint this. I said that our model, the Cameron High School model, I know are translated to loads of other black schools across the South, if, if not the country. Right. And that's been confirmed by my friends who are senior citizens who say, I recognize myself, I recognize uh, this was Mr. Mr. Morton, uh, this was, you know, your Mr. Morton was my Mrs. Jackson and so forth. You In know, other we, schools. Yeah, but the, the, that flavor, I mean, it could not have been, and it was not, uh, at, at, at white schools because there, well, not just because there wasn't the need. They, our teachers and parents were on a mission. They were on a mission. And I do say clearly in that book, because it is so true, they didn't give their all just because they had to fall on, you know, uh, this job of being a teacher because they weren't being hired by any corporation. They really had heart that they brought to their job. They were all in. This wasn't a fallback position for them. And they didn't resent, oh, this is the only job I can get. It wasn't like that. It was like, my name is Ulysses Wilhoyt, and I'm teaching civics, and I'm going to teach these little young'uns <laughs> until, <laughs> you know, <laughs> until you, they get it. You know, one piece of that I, that I really admire is they were preparing us for the future that didn't exist then. Absolutely. I, I'm, an, I'm an engineer, a degree yes. engineer. At that point in my life, when a guidance counselor told me in the ninth grade, uh, I actually wanted to be an auto mechanic. That was my limited view of the world. Well, and she told me, uh, I said, based on my scores, test scores, mechanics and mathematics, mm -hmm. well, you can, why don't you be an engineer? Well, I didn't mm -hmm. know what an engineer was. She says, I said, what's an engineer? She said, well, it's like a mechanic, but he makes more money. <laughs> That's all I needed. But, but the point was, I had never known or heard of a scene of black engineer. And after that, I told people I was going to be an engineer, and I was told more than one time, well, you know, blacks can't be engineers. Mm -hmm. There's no such thing. And only until I was a senior in high school, three years later, that I actually saw a career day that yes. was created by our teachers. Yes. And, uh, the head of the School of Engineering at Tennessee State, um, Dean Parsons, came out there, and he walked into you the room. You remember his name. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. I'll never forget the day. I mm -hmm. sit there, and I looked at him, and I said, he's a black man, and he is an engineer. Yes. Maybe I can be one, too. Can I tell you how many times in desegregated schools, Minneapolis again, for example, I became aware of guidance counselors uh, guiding black students into um, non-competitive career paths, Absolutely. discouraging college, over and over and over and over again. I hadn't finished what I was saying about uh, what being in a segregated um, environment meant to me and my education. I do know this. I know that my two younger sisters did uh, complete their high school educations in a desegregated environment, and they had nothing like the nurturing, the kindness even, you would think. I, I still don't understand how a system could be so evil, so heinous, that grown, grown people could treat children. And it hurts me to this day uh, in, 
inhumane ways, but it happened. It happened all the time. Well, you know, Chantel, our daughter, was actually discouraged in, uh, in Massachusetts. Yes. The guidance counselor told her she would not go to college. Yes. She didn't qualify for it. And uh, in which case, I told her, I just told her, I said, that's nonsense. Don't pay attention to her. And but it's subsequently, classic. she went on and graduated yes. with a degree in biology and is doing extremely well. And that's the uh, in spite of. In that's spite the of in spite being of, told by the guidance yes. counselor that she wouldn't go to college. When you're told by an authority figure what you can and cannot do, you, you tend to yes. listen very carefully. And if you are already have a damaged psyche or self-esteem profile, then you're going to be all the more open. And, and it, it, it has happened so often that I I actually, you know, desegregation was necessary because segregation was stupid and um, and inhumane and, and had no business in the land of the free uh, as an institution anyway. Not only should it never have thrived, it should never have existed, but then slavery should never have, have existed. That's, can, you know... Can we move into another area yeah, sure. up the farther down in terms of what we're thinking? Uh, I think this is really important. That is your advice. What would you advise? What would be your advice to teachers, parents, and administrators to realize true equality in an integrated setting? I think this would be helpful to teachers today that might listen to this. Yeah, that's a very good question. Um, I'm thinking about that project in Minneapolis, the three-year project that um, was fraught with a lot of anxiety for a lot of people that I did direct. Um, and one of the things I'd advise is we got to have a lot more honesty, a lot more sensitivity in our outlook and in our own teachings. We had a number of sensitivity training sessions where teachers would come to grips or not with the fact that, oh, my God, I've been, I've been saying this to my black students for, you know, 15 years, whereas I've been saying this to my white students for just as long. Why have I done this? They'd never been brought to task to, they'd never been asked the question, why do you treat these two groups differently? What's the distinction? I, as a teacher before the project, I remember asking um, a medical person who came to give us information about, you know, this is what happens when, if a child is having convulsions or if a child, you know, uh, uh, is losing consciousness. There, there was some medical issue, and um, the phrase flesh-colored was used, and I raised my hand in all sincerity. There was no sarcasm at all. I said, but what if the flesh is so dark that you can't tell? I was uh, criticized by my principal and fellow teachers for embarrassing them uh, in the face of this professional. So, you know, I'm mm -hmm. saying a whole lot needs to be done to educate, first of all, administrators, all school personnel. Um, and I mention honesty because, for example, if, if an elected official sees January the 6th as just a regular tour day at the Capitol, then something is really wrong. Something is fundamentally wrong in this country. The same thing goes with our schools. If you can open your mouth and use the term separate but equal, when we all know that that was never mm -hmm. the case, something is wrong. We have to be honest, and we have. it, it starts, I think, with educating the educators. You know, it's mm -hmm. like what I said about teaching it on a university level. I was taught all these courses, all this literature, but there wasn't a single course on how to teach. Right. And there has to be because some professors leave students pulling out their hair screaming, oh, God, just shoot me now, because there's no rapport, there's no understanding. So I think a lot of education and sensitivity training is, and a lot of honesty is necessary for educators. How, how about from the student perspective? Uh, did you ever get any consideration to what it would be like when you were in high school if you had to go to an integrated school? Oh, if I you, did. We knew it was coming. What were I your feelings did. in that area? Some trepidation. Um, some fear that, so, that I knew that 
things would be different. I wouldn't be protected. I wouldn't be free to excel as I was at Cameron. I wouldn't be free to test out my wings to be myself. I would be perhaps one of uh, many overlooked. I use the term invisible, you know, in the chapter right. on segregation, uh, and, and a lot of black students are just plain invisible. Yeah. You know, I didn't have that much perspective about that. Hmm. I was just simply afraid of it. Yeah. I had no well, inter yeah, interest it. in yeah. going to an integrated school. Yes, I, exactly. I had personally been attacked more than once in the streets in Nashville right. by white kids. Right. Uh, walking from Cameron for my projects in yes. Nashville to, to Cameron High School, yes. they used to wait Who and throw, wants throw rocks at us. So the idea of going to school with these kids was nothing I wanted in my life. It scared the daylights out of me. I, my fears were, in fact, um, validated by my younger sister's stories to me. They'd come home sometimes in tears. It, it, somebody had to do it. Some generation had to do it. Right. Had to be there at the front lines. You know, it's like soldiers. Okay, well, you guys go first, and you know, we know you're gonna get killed. It's a it's a harsh world, and it's a harsh reality. But the first, we were the last generation of segregated. I do not at all envy the first generation of, of integrated. Oh my God, no. And and they had a very difficult time. They envy my high school experience and my older sister's high school experience because we got to go to Cameron High School and, and all the benefits that came therein and, and the, the, there were so many. It was incomprehensible to them that they just couldn't have the same experience, but they were forging new ground. You know, um, that leads me to remember some, we've had a lot of conversations about these sort of, sort of things. There were some incidences that happened to you in high school yeah. that I think you would like to highlight. Uh, first of all, I, uh, was this, you know, this is a leading question. Was there anyone in particular in our high school that had an uh, Im impact on you <laughs> and your life? Because uh, we all know the answer. Both, we both know the answer to that yes, question. Yes, we do. Yeah, and, and that's, my, that's my little Cameron story that I write about. Mrs. Lois Dunn, our intrepid uh, French teacher who um, is largely responsible. Wait a minute, before you praise her, we need everyone to know that I was in her home run. On my card, one day she sent home to my parents that I was becoming a smart aleck. Gee, I wonder where okay. she'd get that idea. I don't know, but hmm. you know, I, I, anyway, so you go ahead and praise her now. <laughs> well, I, I would love to. I'll say one thing. She was so inscrutable. I'd never met anyone. So, I mean, if she didn't tell you, there's no way you'd know what she was thinking. To, absolutely. No, you wouldn't. But, but she, was, uh, she was such a champion. She, uh, I, I uh, finished high school with the major uh, in French and college with a major in French and, and secondary education. And uh, even though my, my later degrees are, are in English language and literature, I, you know how much I love um, speaking French and, and, and enjoying our travels when we visit. You um, believe French you're French, French, but go ahead. I do not. <laughs> you do. <laughs> <laughs> that is so inappropriate. Um, Mrs. Dunn um, went to the school board because uh, the curriculum at black schools allowed for two years of French, whereas the traditional curriculum at white schools was three years. And uh, what did I say about Mrs. Dunn? She never went into battle unprepared. So there must have been strong forces uh, to have her come back to Cameron in defeat. She told us, well, the school board does not allow um, third year French, but there, were, there was this core group of us, at least 12 or 15. We were so interested in French. We wanted to continue our education. She, she told us, she said, don't, don't give up. And um, I don't know to this day how she did it, but I know that she did it. And I mentioned that little pitchers have big ears. Sometimes I'd be walking down the hall and two teachers would be speaking together and I'd hear the word French. And after a while, you got a sense. So something is brewing here under, under the cover. And before we knew it, our, our group um, was told, here's this hour. It's all carved out. You're, you're all here, and it's going to be French club or some sort. I don't know what they called it. They didn't call it a class because they couldn't call it a class. They didn't call it French three because they couldn't. 
we couldn't have French three textbooks because we weren't allowed to be in a, we weren't allowed to have the class. What did she do? She got us um, a novel, François Sagan, uh, Un certain sourire, a certain smile. And we couldn't believe it. Oh my God, what, it, what is this? There are no pictures in this book. There's no index. There's, there are no translations. There's nothing. What, are, what about all these tenses? I mean, plus parfait, what is that? We were, we were appalled. She didn't, she didn't bat an eye. Here's your book. Here's your book. Here's your book. Here's your book. And I do recollect that we went from absolutely excruciating pain trying to work through that book to the point where we could actually relate to the heroine to some limited extent, understand part of what was going on. Um, we learned so much through her expertise and the way in which she, she that was just a foundation, of course. We, we did a whole lot of other things besides that. And I do say at the end, and I mean this, this is absolutely true, I don't know if we were graded, how we were graded, how could we have been graded? The course didn't exist. But I know for a fact that we were the best educated French students in the city of Nashville, and the course didn't exist. And I reap uh, a benefit from that, having a chance of traveling in Paris with you. Yes. Well, I speak no French, <laughs> and, and I have my own personal tour guide, so it worked out real well. <laughs> uh, you know, after, I'm proud of that. Uh, I, I am. After, okay. Uh, you know, after covering so many areas of your life, uh, just a little additional question in terms of your legacy. You know, uh, what legacy do you want to leave for your family or community on the things that you've done and your experiences? Well... That sounds kind of pretentious, you know, like leaving a legacy, but I do understand what you're saying, and I know this much. I want, I want our children and our grandchild and our great-grandchildren, and I mean that in the larger sense of the word, not just our family, but I want them to get back some of those precious treasures that we had um, growing up um, through our educational process. I want them to learn good manners and kindness toward others and humanity and to speak out against wrongs and to live by the power of their convictions and to be the best and the kindest person they can be and to not be afraid to venture into unknown worlds, to be excited about life and to love people and to understand that if, if there's a law and it dehumanizes a group, any group, then something must be wrong with the law. Something must be wrong with the society, not with the group in question, not with the people, but let's, you know, let's have some critical thinking happen here. I'd sure like to leave all that, and that does sound pretentious, but it's, it's really... At its base, it's just humane. That's all it is. It's humane. You know, uh, we had a lot of experiences in high school. Yes. A lot of people we've known yes. over these years. Yes. Uh, I think we need to speak a little bit about success, the successes that came out of that environment, uh, of the many, many teachers, all the many teachers. We, we, did you stop it? Because I th one piece we have, I think we want to acknowledge, and that is the number of successful students that came out of our high school. Yeah. Uh, the number of, of, especially the number of teachers and ministers in churches. I, I, I couldn't even start to count them. It's just astronomical. Uh, quite a few engineers, doctors, yes. you name the professions, but also many, many people that didn't go on to finish college. Right. Left high school. Were able to go out and find jobs in factories, other yes. blue collar jobs in areas. They had families, very yes. successful. Uh, obviously, there were a few failures. People had difficult sure. times in their lives, but the, the, so so many. The, the number of successful people that came out of that high school uh, is just unreal. It it is, and again, I I have to look at you know our our, our um, principal is legendary. 
Or Jackson. Uh, or Jackson. And incidentally, um, the Cameron High Alumni Association runs the Or Jackson Scholarship Fund, and that's where all the um, author uh, royalties from this book are going to that scholarship fund because it just seems to make sense, you know, in the larger scheme of things, a labor of love, then you should return that love in, in any way you can. But I think because of the incredible dedication of our our teachers, our administrators, and, the, you know, I mean, we go home, we learn the same lessons we go to school, we learned the same lessons. They really were in loco parentis. They really did continue the, the, the learning and the guidance um, that we received at home. And they made many of us just plain want to excel. They made many of us understand that, okay, maybe this world is not ready for you yet, but you're going to help it be ready. And in the meantime, you're going to prepare yourself as much as you can, as fully as you can, so that when finally these these barriers are lifted, then you know you will be there. So yeah, we 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 run the gamut, honey. As you know, we go from you know people who never spent another another second um, in an educational environment after graduation, you know, to um, terminal degrees and everywhere in between. But that was made possible, let me put it this way, and this is not as, had we not had Cameron, had we not had that supportive and yes, all black environment, the story would have been different for many of us. I will say that, and that's just the plain truth. So man, and Mr. Jackson was a father figure for Ooh. so many students that didn't have fathers. Right. My father was at home, I had a father. However, more than once Mr. Jackson was taught me for some reason or another. I remember one time in particular, uh, it was about dress. <laughs> so, and he and I absolutely think he knew the name of every kid in that school. I believe he did. Uh, he stopped me. Pillow? Need to talk to you. I'm like, oh boy, what's now? He looked at me and says, the shirt you have on is designed to be worn with a necktie. Excuse me. The next time you wear that shirt, you come to school, you put on a tie. Yeah. Yes, sir. That's right. That was the kind of principal That's we right. had in that school. Uh, he was uh, unreal. And a lot of teachers were the same way. But so encouraging in all situations. And but respect. But respect. Respect was key. And, and my goodness, I, I, I want us to get that back. I, if I, in the legacy question, if I, if I omitted respect, self-respect, respect of others, we, we absolutely, what was that saying? That was the worst thing of all. Uh, you don't have any home training. If you said mm. that, that you, you know, that total disrespect. That was the right. worst thing that could be said. You, you do not know how to behave <laughs> in public. Um, that was key. One question for you. Um, this is, I don't know where this is going, but it, is there anything you have always wanted to know about me but never asked? Wow. After all this time, I'd like to know how much of yourself you saw in the book, how much you related to it. I mean, you've told me many uh, supportive things about, about what I wrote about, but did you see yourself a lot? A, a, a terrible amount of times. Uh, uh, I, just one example is, it, it, when, during my era of growing up, uh, we had to become adults fast. Mm -hmm. uh, I remember one particular day, Nashville, Tennessee used to have this clean up, fix up, paint up mm -hmm. uh, parade every fall to encourage people to fix. They literally had a parade. Mm -hmm. They don't have that anymore. But uh, in, in those days, you, in schools, the, uh, elementary school, I was in sixth grade, we had what you call school patrols. And we had little badges on and everything, and, and we had people across the street with the patrol ladies and so forth. Anyway, they had an event downtown Nashville once uh, for, uh, for all the school patrols uh, early Saturday morning, and Mayor Ben West was down there. Yes. Mayor Ben West uh, was legendary in his yes. efforts to, uh, to, uh, to get lunch counters segregated in Nashville. Mm -hmm. Through my fact, it was a result of his words that it happened in Nashville and uh, spontaneously right. spread through the South. Yes. That was my one chance to meet him. But this particular morning, uh, for whatever reason, I woke up late. Nobody woke up in my house. I was 10 years old. I got on a bus and rode downtown mm -hmm. to this meeting. I got there late. And I reflected back on that, to, going back to your book, on how early, and I'm not alone. Mm -hmm. There were so many of us. 
I had to grow up fast. Yes. I was the oldest in my family. Yeah. I literally babysitted my brothers and sisters. Yeah. Uh, in, in our community. You had a job at 12. Uh, yeah. Yeah. And that's, and that's the kind of things I saw in the book. The evolution of, of going from those days to where we are today and the potential of, of integration, what integration offered, uh, was something I wasn't aware of. But I lived through those days and I had a chance to see a lot. Uh, mm-hmm. I saw the racial, uh, the sit-in demonstrations mm-hmm. downtown, the, mm-hmm. the uh, racial riots downtown Nashville. Right. I had a chance to m- meet a lot of people. Uh, Muhammad Ali, in those days he was Cassius Clay. Mm-hmm. Uh, before he became Muhammad Ali, I met him on the corner of 17th and Jefferson Street downtown <laughs> Nashville, across from Fisk University. You know, the point is, through all of those things that you wrote in the book in terms of the history, the uh, the the whether it be discrimination or not. Oh, by the way, I, I don't want to uh, neglect this piece of it. And let's skip that. Go on to my career. There are some whites in my career that I would not have made it without. I had some I mentors. Understand. I didn't understand yes. what they were doing for me in a lot of cases in yes. those days. Uh, but I mean, Tony Rigari. Uh, they were was, mentoring you. They, I mean, I had some people looking out for me in those yeah. days. I didn't recognize it. Harry Patterson, right. who was an employee relations guy when I started working at General Electric in Hendersonville, Tennessee, and so forth. So as I read that book from one chapter to the next to the next until it led down to the essays written by all of our peers and myself, you know, I, I felt every moment of it because I saw, mm. I remember the first time we were sitting at home on TV, there was a black, mom said, there's a black person on TV. I said, well, mom, how can you tell? She says, well, can't you see the skin's darker? That was my first real understanding of mm-hmm. something's different about right. how we exist in right. this world. Uh, it, it, and those steps that you wrote about in the books were yes. the things that carried me the, the, to various points in my life when I was trying to come to grips with what all this was about. Yes. Uh, having lived in the cocoon, yes. it wasn't always obvious to me that I was I was going to be treated different right. anywhere. Yeah. Um, the minute I got downtown, I was different, but I didn't understand the root of it. Mm-hmm. To be quite honest, I got my best really grip on all, a lot of that stuff. Was really It's going to sound late, late in life because I'm in my 30s when the TV series Roots came on. Mm. That it, hit millions of people, I, black, white. I had a lot of that knowledge in me, lives. but I had never had a chance to put it together yeah. to try to make, I don't know if you can make sense of the environment we lived in, but at least make sense of it in the sense that you know what happened. Well, that's why I call uh, America sometimes um, schizophrenic. You know, I, I do that often because we've got all these great impulses and all these horrible impulses, and, and we, we're everywhere on the continuum uh, in between. But I, before this is over, thank you for that, because mm. as much as we talk at home and everywhere else, I, I, didn't, mm. I, didn't, I didn't know that. Mm. One, one other thing I want to be sure mm-hmm. gets on HBCUs. If I had... Not been admitted to Tennessee State because I was not the most dedicated student. I worked. I, I've kept. I was smart, a good student, but I didn't do right. good grades because I didn't put a lot of homework. Do a lot of homework. If it hadn't been for Tennessee State and opportunity to go to an HBCU and them admitting me, I doubt if I would have had the career that I had. I was. I was not psychologically, I, academically. I think I was done okay. Mm-hmm. I was not psychologically prepared for an integrated environment. Clark College, by the same token, and and HBCU prepared me for University of uh, Minnesota, University of Chicago, uh, teaching at Michigan State mm-hmm. University, where my, m- my own hiring became an issue uh, with the English department. They uh, weren't quite ready to have a, a third um, uh, black person on their faculty with 65 um, other English professors. I don't, think, one too many, I don't so. think it would have been so traumatic for me or you if we have gone to an integrated school Absolutely. before. Absolutely. We had we, enough of the support of you. Well, one thing I want to say real quickly before our conversation is over is that the reason Nashville is in the title is because Nashville is one of the factors that created this perfect storm for who mm-hmm. we are. Nashville is the only city that had a, a, an elected person, uh, Mayor Ben West, say publicly when Diane Nash asked him, do you really think segregation is right? He actually said no. Right. That, that, hasn't, that did not happen in any other southern city 
period, hands down. We had black institutions of higher education. This means something to a child when he or she can see, ooh, there's Fisk University, there's Tennessee State, there's Meharry Medical College. That's a black institution. That means that maybe I could go there. That's important. First, first, and we had all these first uh, public denominational... Park, first public park in the, yeah, co in the country for blacks. Um, um, institutions, right. the Methodist Church where my dad worked, um, Baptist, um, a, a lot of innovations, racial, came through those church denominations. So that's, mm -hmm. that's why Nashville is part of what I wanted to build into the fabric of yeah, why we, we, we were blessed to have been we in Nashville. Blessed. It was one of the we more liberal cities in the South during yeah. that era. And I know the uh, housing situation was unique. I think uh, a lot of uh, even that brand new developments, the Haynes area, the several Haynes area, brand new houses. A person with a, a blue collar job working at the post office and so forth could go out, and go out and buy their own home. That's true. In Nashville during That's those true. days. That's true. You didn't have that everywhere. Yeah. So and so we were blessed in the sense that we were Perfect in, storm. in Nashville. Yeah. Perfect storm. <laughs> Are we done? Please. Sure. I love that you guys had a very natural back and forth. I uh, really enjoyed it. Thank um, you. I would love to hear a little bit more about, and, and I'm going to remind you to talk to each other, right. about Cameron. And mm. maybe if you could remind each other what a typical day there was like, putting yourself there and thinking about the sounds, the smells, the feel when you when you walked in on a day. Of I think we'll offer great contrast because, uh, well, That's she was a real good student. <laughs> I had other plans going to school, so you go ahead first. <laughs> well, when I think about Cameron, I, I just think, you know, it's wonderful to be able to say, I, I looked forward to going to school. I did and too. and that's, I that's did a, too. The, the only day I didn't look forward to it was when Maddie King said she was going to beat me up after school. <laughs> <laughs> that was kind of scary. But, and my dad said, now, now, Glow, now you know you don't have a stomach ache. Now, come on now. Go to school. Get in the car. Let's, let's go. And so, you know, that, that just made me tougher. That's all. That was one day out of how, how many. Because, oh, I hadn't mentioned that Cameron at the time was a six-year yep, enterprise, that and that's it. really... Th that's Se seventh through twelfth grade. Exactly. We had All no middle building. school. We had no junior high school. Cameron High School was seven through twelve. So we had an awful lot of time to get used to that environment and Became become home. comfortable in, the, in that environment. And for me, the smells were always, always fresh. Our, our, our janitorial staff w was on the case, and they made sure... Everything was clean and and smelling fresh all the time. I remember the smell mm -hmm. of pine saw. I remember what the gym smelled like before and after <laughs> the cleaning. I remember the ladies in the lunchroom, and I shouldn't call them ladies. That we called them lunchroom ladies at the time, but um, the 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 cooks in the lunchroom were also uh, very aware that we were children, and if something was out of place, they would pull our coattails and say. You might want to pull that skirt down just a little bit, young lady. They would do that as well. Um, it was, I knew I was going to enjoy and be challenged every day. I wasn't afraid because unlike you, <laughs> I did do my homework at night. <laughs> well, you know, one, one, another piece of that, though, at Cameron, I always knew I was loved. That's right. That's I the remember. That's right. I, I, now, even though I, I wasn't a dedicated student, I was never really in trouble. But in one particular case, I don't know why I had been sent to the principal's office. And I never will forget, I sit outside the office because we knew Mr. Jackson, they did use a, a corporal punishment. In those they days. did. They used a paddle. They did. And I'm sitting out, I just knew I had to come. I had never gotten a whooping before in school. And I remember Miss Owens, our secret, his secretary. She was beautiful. I sit out there, and she just recently passed away, over 100 years old. Yeah. I sit outside that office that day, and... I sit there and sit there and sweat and sweat it. And she looked at me and she said, get on out of here, boy. <laughs> I was never so happy in my life to get out of that office. She, she let me go. I never saw Mr. Jackson that day. She was always so but sweet. In, 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 I picked care of the paper route. I worked from the time I was in the eighth grade up until I uh, finished high school and so forth. So they knew that by the time I got, I got up in the morning at 4.30 to go to work and so forth, I got to school late pretty often because the papers were deliberate late. And so I'd come into school. I wasn't sent. I wasn't punished. I wasn't, no. They knew I was working. That was a reality. I, I remember for you. Uh, my math class, which I took uh, some advanced, uh, trigonometry, geometry, and so forth, from Miss Ledette. 
And I also had one real easy class. It was, it was some basic bookkeeping kind of stuff in, in, at the last period of the day. So I literally lay my head on the desk and go to sleep. She never wow. thought I got an A in the class. So it wasn't, wow. it, you know, it was easy class. But the point was that teachers were supportive in ways yes. that are not traditional. Uh, a, a good friend of ours, you can, I won't call her name, uh, you can tell the story uh, of, of uh, uh, pregnancy in high school. And oh, yes. And the lengths that people, teachers Well, you know, teach. she wrote an essay in the book, so She's I can call book. her uh, name, uh, Perion. Um, I decided that since this was my Cameron story, but I wanted to be sure that other voices were heard, I did invite faculty and uh, other classmates to write essays, and, and I got 14, including yours, um, individuals, I think four teachers, four faculty members, um, and uh, Perion's story was one, again, of great support. She, she was in my class, and, and we love her. She, she just had her 75th dinner party that we attended. Um, Perion, uh, uh, how did she put it? We, I informed my parents that our, our family was expanding. She was in, <laughs> in love, and um, she was pregnant, and the, t the teachers, Mrs. Washington, drove her to and from school. She had um, support from the administration. She managed to do something in the summertime to make up for the time she was off. When, at, in, in, at any rate, she graduated with us, um, didn't lose time, didn't lose, and she didn't lose her respectability either. Of course, in those days, uh, pregnancy was... It was real she, disgrace. Yes. Uh, and that's not what she, that's not what she found at Cameron. She, she had support, and there's a section where I talk about the things teachers did that nobody knew about, they they were so discreet, but if you needed anything, if you needed money for a field trip, if you needed clothes, they found if a you way. needed to, a, a shower, if you needed more sleep, what you needed, you got from them. So a I, typical I was, day was a... I, I'm not trying to... But, I'm not trying but, to idealize but, but, our experience. Put, put it this, it, way. this is true. When I, the gaze, days I spent at Cameron were the most... Well, the happiest days of my life for a lot of years. Until that's, you that's, married me. That's right. <laughs> the, the transition into adulthood is horrible for so many people. Yes. It was extremely yes. difficult for yes. me. Yes. And leaving Cameron, I guess I thought the world was going to be just as happy. Oh, my goodness. And then, uh, and then reality set in. Yes. And uh, so many years between that, the Vietnam era, I was drafted yes. into the military for a couple of years. Yeah. Academics, I, I, did not I didn't have the habit of studying before the military. I got it through but maybe freshman year, sophomore year, just barely. Next thing I knew, I dropped out of school. Yeah. Drafted into the military during the Vietnam era. Uh, I came, once I got back, got married and a baby, I stayed on Dean's List. Full time job in nights in engineering, so I mean I was I learned that studying did you make a difference. To focus. Yes, <laughs> yeah, it made a difference. Yes. but the point was those were some really uh, for self uh, encouraging days. They were happy days. Mm -hmm. They was they they were safe. They were the days that I thought life was going to be. Yeah, it turns out it wasn't quite that. Well, it did make us who we are. It made are, a big difference. It? But it really Cameron, did. that's one reason I know she wrote the book, and I and absolutely, if I if I were a writer, I think I would have tried to do the same thing. I believe we were blessed. We, I think we were in a unique situation. We were. That provided us with opportunities. It was a perfect storm in, in life, in love, opportunities, and support. Mm -hmm. uh, and, you know, between our homes, our parents, school, and church, we were given some tools mm -hmm. that have carried us an awful long way in life. Yes. Awful long way. Yes. Um, I have, like, one or two more. Uh, sure. I, you started to do this a little bit, but maybe in, uh, one more time, if you can tell each other what you remember about the other one in high school. What was your first oh, I can't <laughs> wait. Oh, Diane, you let go, me you, begin. You want to go first? Where do I begin? I, I oh, get, yes, I I'm going my first. Of you. Okay. <laughs> my, I'm the class of 65. Thomas was in upper class when the class of 64. And uh, you were, of yeah. course. And uh, here's the thing. I had this older sister who was oh. Miss Thing. She was Lady Cameron. 
Uh, she was valedictorian. Lady Cameron's our home co- homecoming queen. She was. Uh, she she won best actress in a dramatic role at our school play. I followed, but I was a, a little pale shadow. I was Lady Cameron, which which was an amazing, amazing experience for me. I was not valedictorian. I was salutatorian, um, and I did not win any prizes for my little dramatic walk-on part in, in the one play I was in. But I had a very dear friend in my class. His name was Ronald Pillow. We called him Ronnie. He was the younger brother of you, yeah. <laughs> and um, I loved him always. He he died uh, too early in life at, at 30, 33, was it not? Right. Yeah. Mm-hmm. But he was always su- such a such a sweet young guy, and I knew I knew his older brother because uh, Ronnie was epileptic, and um, when Ronnie would have seizures. The, the teachers would let Thomas know, and, and Thomas would come with such determination and such love for his brother. And he, if it was a grand mal seizure, of course, those are, you know, those are really uh, frightening to, to people who are not used to seeing them. He would take care of his brother and just like, like he was his father or something. And I, I remember how I admired you, your love for your brother and the way you just... You just strode down the hall. I mean, you know, some people are embarrassed, even today, by epilepsy. I mean, my goodness, it's been with us since before Caesar's time. But um, because of Ronnie, I wrote a paper, my first little research paper, and it was on epilepsy. And you always, I was always affected by you were your brother's keeper, and you took care of him, and you loved him, and I admired that about you. Um, Sadly... You had the hots for my older sister, <laughs> Lady Cameron, class of 63. So you didn't pay any attention to me at all. I knew who you were. I don't believe you really knew who oh, I yes, was. Oh, yes, I did. <laughs> so, so my impression, well, a couple of three things. First of all, I played in a band. I was in the ninth grade. I never forget. And I, Mr. Morton, our band director, convinced her to start playing in the band. He put on a big bass violin. Yes, he and did. I, never, I played a trumpet, and, and they in the band room, they were on the opposite side of the band room from where I sat. And I now I think it was the first time I really noticed you or knew who you were. You would have been in eighth grade at that point in time. Oh. And I, uh, she came and she, still. And, she, and, she, and she was not, let's put it this she wasn't fat. Let's leave it as that. I sit there and look, and I'm thinking... Just say what you t- always say to me. You had skinny, skinny legs. legs. I'm like, why did they put that little girl on that big bass violin? <laughs> and, and that was the first note. I'm thinking, I don't get it. And I used to sit there looking across the band. I was really confused. <laughs> I'm thinking, okay, so that was, that was ninth grade. Later on in the 10th grade, I was walking down the hall, and, and you, your friend, girlfriend, Willie Francis Lewis, and I looked at her, and I thought, ooh, she's cute. Mm-hmm. That was my thought. And I thought... But then I looked at it, her shirt, her, her blouse, sli- uh, one of her blouses was not tucked in. Oh, my. And I looked at her, and I looked at her, and I said, she got skinny legs. And I looked at the blouse, and I and thought, her shirt's all I said, tucked. I'm thinking, I better keep on going. I'm leaving. Then later on, I, 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 one more time later on, I, I got her attention. I was a dating age by then, uh, mm. junior year, maybe, sophomore. But, and I thought about asking her out. But a good friend of ours, Ernest Dixon, we were all in the Methodist Church. Her, her father and Gloria's father were both executives in the United Methodist Church. They were both they bishops. Were, m- yeah. bishop, they were both bishops eventually. Ernest, as far as we knew in the school, Ernest and Gloria had been betrothed. <laughs> I got it right? <laughs> no, betrothed. Betrothed. I always say betrothed. <laughs> <laughs> but as far as I knew, they were going to be married. Well, I thought it was that you, you were too busy calling my house and <laughs> having me answer the phone <laughs> uh, so that you could say, hello, may I speak to, to Claudia? Claudia. <laughs> yes, I thought that was what well, distracted thing, you. Back to her French, your French. I me- you remember I sit in a chair, and if I was smarter, I sit in front of Claudia, who was a straight-A student yes. in French. And, and, and no, my ethics weren't so great that I would not copy off of her. I would have, <laughs> but I wasn't smart enough to sit behind her. That's sad. I, I know. <laughs> and so I just struggled. And Miss Dunn just k- k- gave me a grade to get me out of her French class because <laughs> <laughs> she didn't want to bother me anymore, I guess. <laughs> well, that's, that's our saga. Who knew that after so many years, mm-hmm. because of, largely because of some of that's our friends from Cameron High, eventually, we had dinner once a month. 
one of my good friends told him that uh, where I was. Yeah, that is I great. Cameron it. had a lot to do with our getting married because sure we did. did. For, for since we turned fifty, so it's been over twenty years. We've gone to dinner with a group, and 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 Gloria's one of her best friends was in is in that group, and that's how I basically stayed connected with you. And then eventually, and you always were good about calling my my parents. Yeah, I, it turns out uh, your father was my bishop when I lived in Cleveland, Ohio. Yes. And when you were in Minneapolis, yes. I think it was. Right. And so I stayed in touch with your family. Right. And that's how I eventually reconnected with you. Yeah. Um, Maybe I'll write a story about us. Uh, you know, your uh, Grace has book rights uh, for that <laughs> That's for right. our, our relationship. I have a who has it goes book on for years. <laughs> uh, we, we won't get into all that because you don't have no, enough we time. No, 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 sure. I mean, that was such a lovely, lovely uh, oh, to end on. Yeah. But um, uh, I'm, I'm curious, uh, you started to talk about this, but if you could kind of tell each other, and maybe this is more you telling Thomas, but. Um, how, in what ways do you think schools are still segregated mm. today? Oh, boy. And, and oh. sorry to complicate the question. No, no. How, how do, you, do we recreate the best parts of the black school experience for schools? Well, e excellent. Honey, I want to talk about uh, our granddaughter, Raven. Uh, when we married, Raven was... Uh, in middle school, and because our daughter's uh, work schedule kept her out of town Monday through Friday, and because Thomas worked evenings um, at uh, Saturn, Raven and I had a lot of time together. That's when we really bonded and truly became granddaughter and, and, and grandmother. And she, she'd come home with so, we, we talk, she had so many experiences. One of the things that first hit me was that the friends she would bring home were of all persuasions, all ethnicities, all races, religious backgrounds. And, and I would say to her, I'd say, wow, honey, your, your education is so much more diverse than mine was. So in some ways, um, at least her experience saw her have the kind of exposure, early exposure to cultures, different cultures, uh, than, than we ever did. And I think that's real important. I think that's very important. Um, there are many instances where segregation within integration occurs. Mm -hmm. um, and that's, I think that's a natural human instinct in some ways. Let me, let me be where I'm comfortable. Let me go wh where I'm comfortable. Let me be with the group uh, with which I am most comfortable. But I remember, on the one hand, I absolutely admired um, Raven's uh, circle of friends and the diversity that she experienced. On the other hand, I was sorry, again, for her, as I was for you know my sisters, as you know, that she didn't have the kind of nurturing that we had. I think the only way we can get it back is to actually consciously, proactively legislate and, and work hard to bring it back. In my book, I say that I think, and this sounds very old school, very old fashioned, I really don't care. I think that um, schools, certainly high schools, I think it would be the earlier the better, kind of like learning a language. The, the younger you are when you start, the easier it is, kind of like swimming. Um, I think we should have courses in ethics. I think we should have courses in critical thinking. I mean, sometimes laws are so stupid, y y all you have to do is have the ability to critically think, to say, no, this is just plain wrong, wrong. To, 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 to <clears throat> know that you need to do something about it. I think teachers have to work hard and consciously and conscientiously to make these things happen. They're not going to happen by themselves. Things mm. uh, are in bad shape, I think, in our institutions. Uh, what's that one thing on Fox News, crisis in the classroom? Well, yes, there, there are all kinds of crises in a lot of classrooms for, for many reasons, but so, so much of that reason is that we don't have what you and I had at Cameron High School. Right. And, and if it's not worked for really proactively, it's not going to happen. 
I've got a couple of things. Uh, when I was in Cleveland, I had an opportunity to teach a class uh, to high school students on business. It's a project mm -hmm. business from Junior Achievement. Mm -hmm. And the, the, the sad part of this is the, the, the school sit in a predominantly white neighborhood, mm -hmm. but all of the students were black. Were blacked. Yeah. All of the white students have been bussed out of their neighborhood yeah. somewhere else, and all the black students have been bussed into yeah. them. It was a conscious effort, effort to maintain segregation. Mm -hmm. But they were adhering to the federal requirements for busing. Stupid. Stupid and a waste of money and yeah. a waste of opportunity. And, yeah. so, and I, I never forget teaching that class. It, it was, really it was like it, It's like every Wednesday for about 10 weeks or whatever it was. So that was one point. I think the, the real goal needs to be to want people to get along. That's right. To create an environment where people can socialize with, no matter what their environment are, what their yeah. religions are, what their sexual orientation are, and, and, and treat each other as human beings. Right. Which brings me to, the, to my second point, because I had an experience on diversity. And, and I learned a lot myself in this area. It, 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 this is going to sound, I didn't know, late, up until my 30s, I guess it was, that blacks were the only ones that had, were discriminated against. I thought we had a monopoly on that kind of mm -hmm. thing. I had not been exposed to it in any other way, shape, or form. When I was at working for digital equipment, we had a one-week uh, diversity class, and there were 60 people in this class. 30 of them were women, 30 of them were men. Of those, each 30, 30 were uh, uh, minorities, 30 were white, mm -hmm. and other side, or 15, 15, 15, 15, mm -hmm. okay? For each week, the facilitator came in and he wrote on the board, men are, and they mm. gave that to the women and sent them off into a room. Mm -hmm. Women are, and they sent the, the men off into a room. Mm -hmm. And we came back and we had to present those. Oh boy, the people were mad, at, all the men were mad at the women, the women were mad at the men. But then, later on, they would say, whites are, mm -hmm. they gave it to the minorities. Minorities are, and gave it to the whites. When all, all of a sudden, now we weren't mad at the women anymore. Mm -hmm. We were mad at the whites. <laughs> and they came in, and, and we did this for a week. But one of the most eye-opening experiences I had was a white woman tearing up about the way she was treated in the work environment. Mm -hmm. My first impulse was, what is your problem? Right. You're white. Yes. You don't have any problems. Right. But the more she talked, uh -huh. the more I listened, yes. the more I started realizing, hey. wow. Yeah. She has a legitimate complaint exactly. about the way she's treated in the work environment. I also heard whites later on that would come in, they would emphatically say, well, I'm French. My family came from France. I'm French. I'm not white. By the end of that week, you sh you, you'll be amazed at the transition that you saw in people because we had all been introduced to, to these other perspectives on relationships. Yeah. And come to realize, oh, I really don't have a good grasp of what this world is about. Exactly. I really don't understand what the problems are for other people because, that's right. but, but I had an opportunity to be taught. And that's why it's so sad that diversity programs are being killed today. Yeah. I think people, uh, th they're good and bad in all kinds of people. Absolutely. And, and, and I, without limits, I can tell you there are many, many people of other races and religions that I'd rather be around than people of my own because of their behavior, and, and, and so the ups and downs. But we all need an opportunity to get exposed to each other so we can learn That's right. and, and evolve in our own way. You know, it's exposure combined with um, respect. Right. If you, if you have the exposure with respect, then that makes all the difference. That's right. where learning can begin. That's where changes in behavior can begin. But... You know, you told me a story that makes me laugh, maybe because, um, I, well, it, it's just a, it's, it's a true revelation of how our, by our not being exposed uh, in early days, we just didn't know you. I think you were in Cleveland, University Heights. Anyway, you had a neighbor and you complained to him. Bobby about, Greenbaum. You, you, you complained to him. Why, oh, Bobby, why, why do you, you know, mow your lawn on, you know, get, Saturdays? Get up on, and, uh, and he's like, no, well, no, Thomas, I, why do you mow yours on Sunday? It, no, okay, yeah, uh, I'm no, Jewish, Bobby, so Jewish. guess what? The Sabbath is not. <laughs> I'm like, well, well Bobby, I, okay. We okay. didn't know. I said, Bobby, okay, what do you mean you're Jewish? What's it got to do with anything? Exactly. I had no idea. Exactly. Oh, oh, by the way, University Heights, at one point, 
10 proportion of speaking was the most uh, populated Jewish community in the country. And, by and me, you uh, didn't uh, know. I had no idea. We were the only <laughs> Protestants in, on the street and Catholic next door and everybody else was Jewish. But, but see, that that's was what an experience. I mean. yeah, that's he and I became well, greatest of friends. Yeah. Uh, he did, but he looked at me kind of, he says, Thomas, why do, you, why do you mow your grass on Saturday mornings? That's my Sabbath. <laughs> I'm like, what are you talking about, Bobby? <laughs> and that's why, you know, what, what, if you combine, it, it, you, can, you know, if we could have the kind of foundation that we had at Cameron and the kind of diversity that our granddaughter had in her school. But again, it's not, it, exposure by itself means nothing. Because, no. you know, well, I, I, know, I, I know that group of people. I hate them. They're stupid. You know, that, that, that will go on and on and on until you get some humanity, some decency, some respect within yourself, some integrity, and say, wait a minute, these are human beings too. I mean, right. I, I learned so much uh, at the University of Chicago about, um, uh, LGBT community, uh, I, I just, again, exposure just hadn't been there before, certainly not in our education, because that's one thing that our parents did not address. And we had to, again, sex. I can't say enough about digital equipment, which is actually part of Hewlett Packard today. Same thing, um, of sexual orientation, yeah. we had open discussions uh, in those days. Yeah. And, 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 and I'll be quite honest, I was raised in an environment where you were pretty much taught to mistreat mm. gay men. Mm -hmm. I, I, I didn't know mm -hmm. there was such a thing as gay women or uh, you know, lesbian mm -hmm. anything. And I've seen men mistreated as I was growing up, and, and that's what I was... And, I, and so I got to digital. i never forget sitting in a meeting, and a guy came who was obviously gay. I was chairing the meeting. I ran it. Ah, what and, do you mean obviously and, gay? See, that's the Well, whole that's thing. what I'm saying. I, I walked in. <laughs> Are you sure? In my mind, when he walked in, well, I know now, but he walked into the room, and, and I'm ashamed to admit it, but I looked at him, and I'm thinking, oh, my goodness. Oh. That was my reaction. Yeah. That's what I've been taught. That's honest. Before uh, time went on, I got to know him very well. Yeah. Uh, others had open conversations. Right. I learned a lot, Again, a, a lot about. Yes. I don't have those issues anymore right. to that degree. Right. I'm not completely where I want to be. Mm -hmm. uh, but I've come a long, long, I long way. And, and I sure as the devil would not mistreat anyone else no. because of their orientation no. or discriminate against them. No. Uh, or their religion or their ethnicity no. or their, but, you, know, you know. I don't know when you get to the point where you feel like you're there, but you keep working I don't, on it. I think you keep trying to approach it. You know, all the seminars, all the, all the background, all the opportunities that I've had to be involved I'm still trying. To, you try to approach until the day you die, I think. But you know, but at least the, you're trying. The sad trying. part is we're taught so many of these behaviors and attitudes yes. so early in life. Yes. I, I'm going to say one other thing. Remember, I told you about the time when I was four years old. Uh, the neighbors and some people moved next door. There's yes. a little white kid. We were in the backyard Tell playing. Tell that story because it's in well, my Well, he just moved in. We sit there and we played. We, he, the two of us played, 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 played. I don't know how long. His daddy stepped out on the back porch and hollered out there, mm -hmm. told him to get in there. I knew there was something wrong. And he went out, we were friends. Mm -hmm. The next day, I'm out front on the sidewalk, and the little boy has learned an N-word. Mm -hmm. And he called you that. Yeah. And That's I'm, in my book because I wanted to make the point that it takes no time, to, no time to teach for this hatred. kind of... That's right, to teach hatred. Thank you. It takes no time I at all. I couldn't have said it better.